thank you for joining us today to talk about some very interesting things that's happening in the world of banking and finance and Royal Commissions. Um, there's going to be some very interesting topics we're talking about today, particularly around the Royal Banking Commission, uh, finance, getting loans. We also have got a, um, a, a guest presenter today and just wanted to give you a bit of an outline about Kate. I've got a small bio that I'll read for you. So Kate Carnell commenced her role as the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman in March 2016. Kate brings extensive experience and knowledge to the role of Ombudsman, having run her own small business for 15 years before becoming ACT Chief Minister in 1995 for a period of five years. Prior to her appointment in the inaugural Ombudsman role, Kate held her position of CEO of the Australian Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which represents more than 300,000 300, businesses across Australia. She has also served two years as CEO of Beyond Blue, four years as CEO of the Australian Food and Grocery Council, four years as CEO of the Australian General Practice Network, and three years as CEO of the National Association of Forest Industries. Kate is a pharmacist by profession and was the inaugural chair of the ACT branch of the Pharmacy Guild of Australia and the first female to become National Vice President of the Pharmacy Guild of Australia. Kate was appointed an officer of the Order of Australia in 2006 for her services to the community through contributions to economic development and support for the business sector, knowledge industries, the medical sector and medical technology advances. Would you please put your hands together for Kate uh, Thanks very much and uh, I'm sorry to get in the way of the way you were supposed to work uh, today, but uh, there you go, it's the last plane to Canberra. <laughs> you know, it's Canberra, it is what it, you know, it is. What it is. Um, I don't have to tell you guys this, uh, small business really, really, really matters in the Australian economy. 2.1 million small businesses are 97% with under 20 employees. If you actually go to the new ATO uh, um, definition of under 10 million, uh, turnover, you get to 99% of Australian businesses are in that space. Lots of them are family enterprises, they make up a large percentage of the employment in Australia and a very large percentage of the, uh, the workforce. Now, um, you guys know that um, a lot because you work in the space or you are one of them or some of them or, or whatever. My job um, as uh, Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, which is the world's worst title, um, the great dilemma is you can't actually make it, you can't abbreviate it, because it's called the spiffio. <laughs> now, I'm a pharmacist, you heard that. I reckon you treat a spiffio with something. Um, but there's got to be a drug, um, or it could be a drug, um, one way or the other. But um, my office was, um, set up just over two years ago and it's an independent role so I'm appointed by the Governor General. The legislation that was passed with support of all sides of Parliament uh, was so that small um, businesses, family enterprises, businesses with under 100 employees, which is the definition, although we're quite flexible in that space, um, have um, somebody or an office in Canberra whose job it is, is to make sure that legislation, regulation, the direction of government, the opposition and others um, is as small business and family enterprise friendly as possible. Uh, so we're independent in that space. We bash up the government, we bash up the opposition with equal aplomb from, uh, from time to time. Uh, we input into government um, policy we give the opposition advice. Unfortunately, the legislation, it, did, it does say that I have to give um, the, the small business minister advice. Unfortunately, it doesn't say he has to take it, which is a bit of an issue. And it certainly indicates, doesn't tell me that the, uh, the opposition needs to take our advice in these areas. So we have um, an assistance function, and which is a more traditional ombudsman function. So we look after small businesses that might have a problem. The sort of problems we handle are things like small businesses that aren't paid, subbies on construction sites, 
financing issues, unfair contracts, you know, all sorts of issues like that, and I could go into that forever, but because I'm going to talk about the Royal Commission, and I'd like to throw in a bit about the ATO inquiry as well um, um, today. So, um, so our assistance function is a more traditional ombudsman function. Our advocacy function isn't. And our advocacy function means that we have the power to have inquiries into various things. Now, we can either have inquiries that we decide to have, um, so self-generated inquiries. Um, one of those, um, that uh, access to justice and affordable capital are both um, inquiries that we've chosen to have because um, we believe that uh, small to medium businesses in Australia don't have access to justice. The court systems is too, are too expensive um, and take too long in its current form. Um, I hate, I wouldn't for a moment try to suggest that our legal system is broken. I'm suggesting that if you want to take on the ATO in court, or BHP in court, or a bank in court, you're going to go broke. You know, I'm sure you would all be aware of that, um, because they've got bigger pockets and longer timelines, and the system costs too much. So, at the moment, we've got a problem in, uh, in, in the access to justice space. And <clears throat> affordable capital for SME growth is an inquiry we're doing because small to medium businesses are telling us that unless they have significant, um, uh, they've got significant bricks and mortar equity, their capacity to get capital to grow their business um, is significantly limited unless they want to go to venture capitals you know, or equity. So if they don't want to sell some of their business, if they don't want to you know, sell their business in, a, in, in you know, three, five years' time or whatever, um, where do they go? And I'll, I'll give you the experience of, say, my pharmacy. Um, my first pharmacy I bought a very long time ago, um, when I was 25, so you can say it was a very long time ago, um, you know, the reality is I grew those pharmacies, you know, I grew that pharmacy and I, um, I refitted it, I made it schmittier, then I bought the pharmacy down the road, then I bought another pharmacy and so on. The reality is I could do that back in the day, you know, and, um, but much tougher now if you don't have, you know, significant bricks and mortar. And by the way, I didn't own the premises of any of those pharmacies. But they were very good businesses, I have to say. And so the challenges are very real in that space for small businesses that are trying to grow their businesses um, and need more than $50,000, which is really easy to get um, from either a bank and maybe even $100,000 sometimes from, um, from the fintech space but a tougher gig if you need more than that. And you know, a basic pharmacy fit out these days, half a mil if you're lucky. Um, so, so we're doing an inquiry into that. Um, and the small business loans inquiry, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment because that's the banks. So we have um, Royal Commission type powers. We can subpoena documents, we can make people turn up um, at, at inquiries, those sorts of things. What we don't have is a capacity to swear people in. So they're allowed to lie to us. That probably isn't true, but for all of that, I, I have no idea why we can't swear people in. But anyway, we can't under our, under our legislation. Um, the small business uh, loan inquiry uh, finding. Now what we did is we did an inquiry that the Small Business Minister of the day asked us to do into a small number of small businesses, small to medium businesses, in fact some of them were a bit bigger than that really, um, um, who had had significant problems with bank loans. Um, they were, um, look I won't go into the details of our, term, of our terms of reference, but we looked at a range of, of different um, cases uh, and what did we find? We found that fundamentally, and this won't surprise any of you, the great dilemma for small businesses uh, with 
uh, contracts with, um, with banks was that over time, the banks, the, in fact all of them, but certainly the four majors, which if they have 80% of the small business market, had produced contracts that were very, very one-sided. Um, in other words, allowed the banks to um, change those contracts whenever they wanted, for any reason they wanted, uh, and the, uh, the small business had very, very limited power once you signed on the dotted line. And I have to tell you, you know, I'd signed lots of those over the years when I owned my own business, and did I know those? Oh, sorry, I shouldn't. Mm. <laughs> Very bad. But when I actually had to delve deep, I said, really? You know, I signed that. Um, my brother um, runs a building company in, in Brisbane. And I um, ran through one of the cases without names, of course, for him. And he said, that can't be true. Because I wouldn't have signed a contract like that. Go and have a look. Because you did. There's a banking code of conduct, as we know, and there's a new one that has just recently been put on the table, but there's been banking codes for a long time. There, I think there's been, what, two court cases ever that have actually upheld a, the banking code. The, the code, although, you know, codes are really important, but do they really protect small businesses? No. Pretty aggressive conduct and practices with loan uh, recovery um, action, you know, significant gaps in access uh, to dispute resolution services outside the court system. I mean, you know, the great dilemma as a small business person, are you going to take a bank on in court? Really? We've dealt with a range of companies that have done it. So what we found was that the system really wasn't uh, terribly fair. Fundamentally, 80-page contracts with lots of, you know, fine print that any, you know, normal person um, isn't going to actually understand or believe or read isn't a reasonable approach. It's not what we think about in terms of fairness and equity. So looking at, um, at having, you know, short, plain English contracts that make it really clear, even if you're going to have 80 pages, well, hopefully not 80 pages, you know, the one, two page are up front, but makes it clear what you're supposed to do, what the bank's going to do, you know, what the, what the rules are of the game. We believe that the bank's approach to what the definition of small business is is, is, far, too, um, is far too restrictive. But some of the issues for us were around timelines, I'd have to say. In terms of, of unfair contract terms, you would be aware that unfair contract term legislation became law in November, on the November the 11th, 2016. So that's quite a long time ago. The legislation was passed 12 months before that. So everyone had 12 months to get their house in order to comply, except that I have to say compliance with that legislation is pretty ordinary. Now you would assume that the four major banks, in fact you think banking system generally, because they've got more lawyers than the government and just about everyone else, would be able to comply with a not that complex piece of legislation in the timeline. Uh-uh. Has not. Well, <clears throat> right now, three of the four major banks have released their new fairer contracts in the last few months, two months. So they were not compliant for a long time. And I'd have to say we are doubtful about at least one of those three contracts and whether it actually complies. I find it hard to understand, you know, why the big four, biggest four um, companies in Australia would perceive that it is reasonable not to comply with the law, really. Um, sorry, but I just find that really hard to get my head around. You know, if you think about it, maybe the reason the banks are in the position they are right now is because they had that view that there's been 22 inquiries into the bank since the GFC. 40 of the recommendations of those various inquiries are pretty similar. None of them were implemented. Um, why not? Because they didn't have to. Um, and so probably you'd have to say maybe the Royal Commission was well, you know, happened simply because the banks didn't perceive 
they really have to care about these sorts of things. And you know, I'll be, I, you know, I'm, I'm honest about about these these issues. Initially, the banks didn't believe that their contracts were unfair. Um, we went to them and said, look, you know, a, a, a clause that says you can change any term and condition at any time you like, and you, the other person who signed the contract, has no capacity to argue with that. You know, no matter how you look at that, you know, ain't gonna fly, boys and girls. Um, and you, you know, you'd be aware of those contract terms. We went to ASIC and said, ASIC, these guys aren't complying. So we've been working with the ASIC in that space. We are um, also working with the, with the fintechs uh, to ensure that the fintech and other parts of the financial industry don't end up in the same spaces as, as, as the banks. So they are compliant with unfair contract term legislation. Um, the unfair contract term legislation is due to be reviewed later this year, even though a whole lot of people haven't quite complied yet. The actual review date, because it was supposed to have been complied with, is, is November this year. Um, I think one of the recommendations of the Royal Commission will be to extend the terms of unfair contracts. Um, currently, unfair contract term legislation is for a single contract um, of three hundred, I think, three hundred and thirty thousand dollars, or a multi-year contract of a million dollars, is covered by unfair contracts. I think that will need or should move up to five million, and maybe a little bit more for agricultural properties and manufacturing loans, because they tend to be bigger, but for small businesses, um, by the, by the nature of that, and. One of the problems in unfair contracts right at the moment is that a small business who believes that a big business has an unfair contract term in their contract, the legislation says that the only real option for them is to, take, is to go to court, which of course, back to my initial comment, isn't really an option. They can also come to us and we rattle a cage and you know try to fix it, and sometimes do. But um, the, uh, that needs to that needs to um, to change now. Royal Commission, what's happened? Uh, you would know that over the last two two weeks, the small small business cases were looked at, and the next tranche are agricultural, rural, and regional uh, cases, which will predominantly be small business cases. So there's still a, another tranche of of, of small business. Uh, uh, um, cases generally, the key topics you can you, you can see them up there, but I suppose just to cut to the chase for a moment, where I'm slightly disappointed um, of the last two weeks, and why is that the case? That it's really really hard when you've only got four or five cases to really you know identify cases that are going to be. Um, Holistic. Um, the issues that they've looked at is responsible lending. When lending has happened to small businesses based upon incorrect facts, you know, you, you saw some of the, the the comments about, you know, just sign at the bottom here. We'll fill in the the information later. I have to say, in our inquiry, we had a number of those of um, small businesses that believed that, like, you know, it was a partnership, so you could, you know. Just sign the bottom, and uh, we'll fix up the top bit, and it'll all be, you know, she'll, she'll be right, mate. And the top bit wasn't exactly right. In fact, wasn't right. Obviously, as a small business person, you have an obligation to sign a contract. But if you're sort of dealing with a, you know, a, a big bank, and you sort of believe that they're not going to dodge you, and you know they're they're big and they're people you can trust, maybe, um, well, at least some people have have done that. I think, though, the major issue is this middle one, the approach of banks to enforcement, management and monitoring of loans to business. What the Royal Commission showed is, and um, we've, we've used the CBA um, Project Magellan um, Bank West scenario, that when CBA bought Bank West, Bank West had a whole lot of loans 
that were riskier, you know, in bank term riskier, than um, CBA had. There's no doubt that was the case. But they bought a portfolio and they built some contracts. What CBA did, and understandably, was they looked at all of those, well, they looked at the portfolio that they bought and assessed each one of those based upon their view of, you know, of risk and where those lines were heading. The issue was what happened then in terms of enforcement. And for me, that's the sort of, you know, the elephant in the room a bit. These were people who had continued to pay what they were due to pay when they were due to pay it. So they weren't behind. There was no financial default. But the contracts, of course, had non-financial default clauses in them, which allowed the banks to, uh, to revalue um, assets, to determine that there was that the industry had become more um, risky, a whole range of things. And so what actually happened is that a range of those lines, in fact, 2,983 that we know about, of performing lines were defaulted during that period of time. Now, you could argue that Combank is doing exactly what they're supposed to do, and that's reducing their risk and bringing Bank West risk in line with Combank risk. Unfortunately, there was a chunk of people out there that were paying what they were supposed to pay that thought they had a contract. You know, one of the cases was somebody had a 20-year loan, um, which was a, an interest plus principal loan that was brought down to a three-year loan, um, you know, and you needed to pay it now, you know, pay it out. Now, how many businesses can do that? And therein lies the problem here. Um, new code of, uh, code of um, banking practice in place. I think it's, it's got a small business area, which you should have a look at. Um, it's a step in the right direction. Again, the dilemma with, the, with the, the code is the code is owned by the ABA. The review of the code is by the entity established by the ABA. And the only real way you can take on the code is in the court system. If the, you know, the internal review system doesn't come down the way you want it to, I thought it was really interesting that Commissioner Hayes, Hayes's comment, Hayes's comments, in um, well, probably this Wednesday, but might be Thursday, he said, you know, he didn't understand why this had to be so complex. Isn't it true that, you know, it should be really simple? That best practice should be don't mislead or deceive. These are his words. Don't act unconscionably. He said. Maybe you don't like that word, because I had to read all those pages. Maybe I should say, just be fair. Ask if, ask if it is fit for purpose. Do your job with due skill and care. Always apply responsible. So what has the Royal Commission found so far? They, in the small business space, they haven't found, they haven't found any chronic illegality. And the great dilemma in the small business space is the contracts allow the banks to do anything they really like. So it's really hard to not comply with the contract because the contract allows a whole range of things to happen, including the things I've, I've talked about. That won't be the case with new contracts that fit to unfair, that are in line with unfair contract terms. That said, these cases were under old contracts. The issue here is culture, isn't it? And really what it comes right down to it is culture and ethics, and it sounds just a little bit bleeding heartish, but at the end of the day, Commissioner Haynes's comments were, were, were absolutely true. What, are we, what do we think we need? We need a culture that is not about, we've just got to protect the bank and the bank's bottom line at all costs, that it is a partnership to an extent, understanding, you know, these partnerships um, have balance and whatever, but there does need to be an absolute culture change in this space. I made a comment earlier about um, unfair contract terms legislation needs to be extended to, in, in, to encourage more contracts, which gives a legal base uh, for small businesses to, uh, to ensure that contracts are a little bit fairer, a little bit more balanced probably never going to be totally balanced, 
but uh, for all of that, a little bit more balanced. I still personally find it really difficult that where a small business lender has paid what they're supposed to pay, is running their business the way they're supposed to what run them, haven't flogged the asset that the, business, that the loan was secured against, haven't done any bad stuff, why it is okay to move against those simply because a bank believes that they might be a bit overweight in hotels or construction in North Queensland or the tourism industry or Tasmania or at the moment we've got a chunk of cases in Western Australia. Um, I just don't think that's what a normal contract uh, looks like. So from our perspective, the banks have a bit of a distance to go. Um, the Royal Commission has a bit of a distance to go, but it's but it's not actually complex. The complex, you know, the, it's, it, it is about a contract is two-sided. You know, if you pay back what you're supposed to pay, if you run your business the way you say you're going to run it, is it reasonable to have a, a system where a bank can move against you and um, revalue your assets, can change the terms and conditions, to move you into default, all those sorts of things, simply because the bank believes that pharmacies are now more risky than they were when they lent me the money. I don't think so. Thank you very much. <laughs>